Here we have our 10 nanometer filament again. Here we have our digestion. We're down to single nucleosomes because this was a full digestion or complete digestion of these 10 nanometer filaments. And now we're going to analyze the protein. So let's look at the proteins that you get out of the nucleosome. You take the proteins, you throw away the DNA, and you run the proteins on a gel. And you run the gel, and there are the proteins separating. And it turns out that there aren't dozens of different proteins at this point. The 10 nanometer filament is really just made up of DNA and five proteins. And these are the histone proteins, H1, H3, H2A, H2B, H4. These are historically derived names. But the histone octamer around which DNA double helices actually wrap themselves contain two each of all of the histones except H1. And there's one molecule of H1 that is associated with each nucleosome. An interesting feature of these histones is that unlike most other proteins, they are very rich in the basic amino acids, lysine and arginine for the most part. These are amino acids whose side chains have amino groups at pH 7, neutral pH, the pH in nuclei and cytoplasm. Amino groups acquire a proton and become positively charged. So basic amino acids have positively charged side chains. It's reasonable that proteins that are going to associate with the very electronegative DNA molecule should in fact be positively charged at the same pH. What do I mean negatively charged DNA? If you remember, the double helix is held together by H bonds between the bases and the outside of this double helix is actually the phosphodiester backbone and the phosphates in the phosphodiester backbone are negatively charged. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that the proteins most intimately associated with DNA, the histones, are those that are highly basic, which is to say will have a positive charge. Now if we take a look at the DNA we've yanked off of the nucleosome prep that we just made, we take a look at that DNA and you run a gel of it under these conditions, you get a single size class of DNA, and that size class is of course 146 nucleotide pairs long. So the final conclusion is histones in a nucleosome, and specifically the ones I've shown you here, protect 146 nucleotides from DNA's one attack. Well, in going from a 10 nanometer filament shown in A on the left here, and cartooned alongside it, to the solenoid, or B, shown in the lower figure on the left, and cartooned alongside it, is a mechanism that's been proposed to explain how 10 nanometer filaments might condensed to form the solenoid and might even undergo several transitions. And, and so it's as if the solenoid could expand and contract much like the pleats or the bellows in an accordion. This is actually an extract of chromatin that is showing you the loops and some portion of the scaffold proteins that are at the center of these loops. Those are DNA loops, the looped domains. And what's really interesting is that the proteins in the scaffold in this extract of chromatin of course, there are non-histones, but they are largely one kind of non-histone. There are other proteins in here, too, which we will not have a chance to discuss. But quantitatively, a major component turn out to be topoisomerases. And that's interesting because it suggests that there are topoisomerases in the scaffold in sufficient quantity to relieve supercoiling during replication of eukaryotic DNA during the assays of, of the cell. Now let's take a look at the different forms of chromatin that you can see in a nucleus. The darker granulated stuff in a nucleus is referred to as heterochromatin, and the lighter granular stuff inside a nucleus is euchromatin. There are two sort of grayish areas in this particular nucleus, uh, in this cross-section, and those are the nucleoli, uh, which are built around the portion of DNA that actually encodes ribosomal RNAs, and so nucleoli are the source of ribosomal RNA synthesis, in particular uh, 28S and 18S and uh, 4S RNA.